everyone. This is Madeline Dale with The Chapter Goddess. And today I have another fantastic author for you guys. She's got an amazing book series out and it's right up my alley with the fantasy and magic and everything. I'm going to let her take it away and give us an introduction to herself and tell us about her books. So Laura, take it away. All right. Thanks. Well, my name is Laura M. Drake. I like to tell people to not forget the middle initial or you're going to definitely be looking at some cowboy romance books that are not by me. So, um, yeah, I started out writing seriously when I lived in Japan a couple years ago, and I started this YA fantasy trilogy that I tell people it's like Harry Potter meets Avatar The Last Airbender, because apparently you can't write a magical academy book without somebody comparing it to Harry Potter these days. And then it's all about elemental magic and like these regions that all have their different elemental magic and their different cultures and this kind of, they, you know, kind of clash and stuff. So definitely has very strong avatar vibes um but yeah so that's my first series and then I have a second series that actually I'm about to release the paperback of it's like a four-in-one omnibus set uh, it's called Japanese hauntings which I guess you can probably assume it's also based on my time in Japan and they are ghost stories that are um kind of like a little bit of the grudge vibes like it's pretty spooky but they're totally clean and kind of got some romance and a little bit of humor mixed in and just some really great characters and they're both slow burn romances um so yeah those are my two current series those books sound fascinating especially the ghost stories like I don't get to read a lot of those and I'm trying to incorporate more of like a variety into what I read with horror and ghost stories and stuff so I'm gonna have to check that out for sure your time in Japan how long were you there I lived there for a little over two years, probably would have been longer, but I ended up coming home when COVID got crazy. And so then I was back, but I, at that point I was already hooked on full-time writing. So I just, you know, like a lot of people are like, oh, it's so hard to find jobs in the pandemic. And I'm like, great. I'll just keep writing all day, every day, even though like (laughs) I definitely was not having the income of a full-time job, but I was doing way more than 40 hours a week, but it was so fun. Yeah, writing definitely takes up way more than a lot of people realize, like, because you also have to focus on trying to, like, make sure your brain and your mental health are there. So compared to, like, now your writing routine here versus what it was in Japan, is there a big difference? Oh, huge, because in Japan, I worked every day, so I'd get home from work at, like, I don't know, 530 or so. I had a, an 80-minute commute to get to work and an 80-minute commute back. So I didn't even get home. Like, even though I got out of school at like 3.30, I wouldn't get home until like five or so. And so, yeah, I I wrote probably like, I don't know, consistently like seven to nine at night, which isn't very long. Like now that I think about it, I'm like, whoa, that's like nothing, you know? But when you have a, a full-time job, it's like a lot to dedicate those extra two hours when you've already worked all day and you're you're like exhausted, you know? But now I I write like, I mean, there was a phase I was probably doing 12 hour work days once I moved home and I, cause I'm like, I love it. What's the problem? But then I had like zero life outside of writing. It was really not healthy, but now I'm a little bit better. I try and stop at like five, but it's just so easy to just be like on your computer and like, oh, I'll just revise this or just like edit this while I'm doing something else. And I'm like, no, I need, I really need to like stop. <laughs> I get, I get it. Like that's, I wish I had more time to like sit and work on stuff because I, I have a son and he definitely takes up a lot of time. He's at school right now, but I keep like, this is in this habit to like look over my shoulder and make sure he's not coming to like crash the interview because he's done that a few times, but I it would be so wonderful to sit down and just like get lost in it. Cause at night I do like, I get, I find myself cause I'll stay up late. I'm that kind of person. I'm like, okay, everybody's asleep. I finally have some peace and quiet and I sit down and I just get lost. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to hate myself tomorrow, but it's okay. I still got writing done. But. Yes. It's like when you can have that moment, but like at a normal time. So you still get sleep. That's really the ideal situation. Oh yeah, for sure. But I drink a lot of coffee to make up for it. So <laughs> I, I try to make up for it. It's, it doesn't exactly work like I want it to, but it kind of helps. But it's let's funny the things. Oh, sorry, go ahead. To say, it's funny the things that like writers will do for their craft. Like what other jobs, you know, are people so passionate about that they're like willing to just put in all these crazy hours on top of other jobs. But it's like, no, we just love it. <laughs> Yes, it's so true. Because I mean, putting the story together and you like get to live it like as it comes to life. And it's yes. it's addicting almost. 
It really is. And you're like, I did not see that coming. And people are like, how did you not see that coming? You're writing it. And you're like, you don't understand. <laughs> yes. The characters surprise you. And yes. speaking of characters, go ahead. Let's talk about your characters in your series. I know there's Emmy and there's Neil and it was Gray, I believe, or some of them. Yeah. Yeah. Impressive. Yeah. So each book actually shifts points of view. So the first book is from Emmeline or Emmy, her point of view. And she's a super... So I guess to break it down, she's the only one at the school who doesn't have magic. And so she feels very out of place and like she's got anxiety and she's really shy. And the only one she feels comfortable talking to are her three best friends and essentially like her mentor teacher who's kind of like an older brother. He's been teaching her for the last like eight years since she came to the school. Mm -hmm. So she, and she also like deals with this bully who it's like, you don't belong here, you know? And she feels the same way. So anyway, so that's kind of, I mean, it's like the first story is, her learning I guess like how she fits in and like how to accept herself despite what other people think and like learning how to love herself and um while that's going on there's like these crazy attacks happening on the school there's people that are going missing across the country and there's like tensions that are um like rising between the different regions around the school and the school is kind of like a political safe zone where like all the, all the different regions send their kids to that school to give them like the best education and try and foster relationships. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, mm -hmm. like all these tensions are happening and it's just getting worse and worse as more people go missing. So like that kind of all starts to set up in book one. And then in book two, you shift to Gray. He's the little brother. Um, he and Neil are brothers. Okay. So he and Ivy and Emmy are all the same age. They're like 15, 16 and um he's like super he's like a lovable goofball you know like he's always throwing in jokes and like making tense situations a little bit less intense but also he's just like super like I love him he's like you know he would do like anything for his friends kind of guy even though Aww. he's like a goofball so that's like it's his story um when so like a bunch of stuff happens in book one obviously that seriously affects him and he's like going through this big struggle where it's like he's dealing with this uh, like dark magic that's essentially like I don't know you could say it's like kind of corrupting him from the inside so he's like fighting the dark magic and it you know a lot of the book he ends up being kind of angsty and like like you see his lovable nature in book one and then book two he's like really struggling so I feel like it's like a nice contrast because you can really see how hard it is yeah and then in book three it goes to the big brother Neil and he's like the one who's like, make sure you get your homework turned in, go to bed on time. Like he's like kind of like their mom, but also their best friend. And he's also like, he's been called a prodigy because he has three different kinds of magic. And most people only have one or like maybe two, depending. Because the magic is based on like back, back like before the country was formed, all the tribes kept to themselves. So like fire magicals would always have fire magical kids. But once the magic started mixing, people could have like different kinds of magic. And um, anyway, so he ends up having three because his parents. And so uh, he's like always dealt with the pressure. So it's funny because Emmy's like, I have no magic. And then he has three, but yet they're both dealing with the pressure in different ways because he feels like everyone's always watching him. And then he ends up having all these crazy responsibilities. And like, anyway, so it turns from this like schoolgirl academy book to like the country falling into civil war and this crazy dark magic, like taking over the country by the end of book three and like all this political stuff. So it really kind of just expands. <laughs> wow, that is crazy. But that sounds like an excellent adventure. Like I love books that grow and grow like that. Yeah, I like, I love reading it. That definitely was my first time writing it, but I was like, oh, this really like grew in scope. And I was like, oh, but I, I like, I like how it turned out because um, like as much as I love Academy books, I feel like they're almost like the fluff of fantasy, you know? <laughs> Yes, sometimes they are. And sometimes you're like, you get a, like a gold mine, like it sounds like yours is. And it just like expands into this crazy, beautiful world. And it's really funny because obviously I was writing this like in the middle of COVID and like all this crazy stuff. So you can really see how that like affects some of the writing. Like when at one point this, it's like essentially a terrorist, like threatening the whole country and they put the country on lockdown. And, you know, like, obviously we were in lockdown. So it's like, people are like, I relate to this so hard. I'm like, I know because I wrote it in the middle of COVID. <laughs> yes. And that's awesome that you put that in there. Cause that's what people, some people really need that to relate to. Cause there's people struggling right now with things and with COVID and it's just, 
I mean, I'm not saying it's going to completely go away, but it's going to get easier at some point. But I know a lot of people are like, let's get it to go away. And you're like, no, it's not going to just go away. Like, this is our new normal, guys. Yeah. It's it's, it's here. It's going to stay. It's not going anywhere. But that's awesome that they can relate to that and like escape in that. Yeah. Super fun. It is. And then for your Japanese haunting series, do you have follow one main character in that one? I didn't get to look at that one really. Yeah, well, kind of. So the first book, um, so they're all actually novellas. So the first one and the second one are from the girl. Her name is uh, Selena. She okay. moves to this. Um, they like move from California to Oregon and then they move into a haunted house, which is what sparks the series. And um, so the first two are from her point of view. So like the ghost that you you meet in the first book, that ghost kind of spans the whole arc, like all four books before, you know, it, that arc is resolved. But then each book after, like in book two, they go to Japan together, her and the boy that she meets. And then in book three, it's like them at college, but it's actually a different point of view. And then book four is the main guy's point of view. So I do switch points of view. I found that apparently that's my thing with writing. <laughs> hey, it but. makes it continues to make the story. And like, that's, that's okay. Like you want the story to keep going. And sometimes you do have to switch point of view. So yeah, I, I like it. Like first, I mean, I think it'd be fun to like, maybe eventually to go back and rewrite like the second and third magic book from Emmy's point of view, just to see what she was going through. But Ooh. anyway, that's neither here nor there. But yeah, so, um, yeah, so the Japanese books do the same. It's like still kind of Selena's story, but you get it from her best friend's point of view and from the love interest's point of view Ooh, uh, in the later books. That's fun. Yeah, it's like way fun because I love, like obviously I love Japan, so it was way fun to sprinkle like cultural bits in and like Japanese phrases and like actually having them go to Japan. I could pull in so many of my own experiences and travels and like memories. I'm like, oh, this is my life. And so like makes me nostalgic. And like, I'm like everybody, please love Japan as much as I do. That would be awesome. I would love to go someday. That's on my bucket list. I To travel more, to go like more places out of the country, getting there someday, someday. <laughs> so. yes. When COVID's like less crazy and we can travel again, you should totally go. Cause I feel like everybody would just love it. Like. It's so different from yeah. America. It's like the food, the culture, the people, like the scenery, just everything is so different. And yet it's so fascinating. Yes. Ah, it's definitely on my bucket list. I had a cousin go. So the world building for the two different series, what did you find was the hardest for that? Um, you know, it's funny. I'd say they both had their challenges in different ways because the magic series is a totally different world. Like there's no technology, there's no roads, cars, like that kind of, I mean, there's roads, I guess, but not like, you know, cement, asphalt roads, not cement. I don't know why I said that, <laughs> but um, it's like they have their own, like each region has their own kind of animals that they they raise and they ride or use for work or like coexist with. And so they have like that, that was challenging and that I had to think of it all but also it was fun because I feel like I could get lost in it more but the Japanese series is based on real real stuff like the you know the second book they go to Japan and are in Tokyo and like the third book they um where are they they're like one of the colleges in California and then the fourth book they're at Berkeley so it's like actual places so that was almost harder for me because I hate research and like having to fact check myself and so it's like nicer when I just create places that nobody can like call me out on <laughs> yeah so I don't know it's like you either have to come up with it or you have to do the research so either way it's like fun and also hard <laughs> it is yes I have to agree it is a full-time writing thing that you've got going on um do you have like hobbies or a self-care thing that you stick with to help keep the mental creativity going yeah, that's something that I'm seriously working on, actually, because like I mentioned before, I was like, I could very easily fall into like the 12 hour day trap and have nothing that I'd be doing outside. And even like, when I'm like, oh, maybe I'll play this game or like, you know, watch a movie, but then I like feel back. I'm like, I'm not earning enough money to just sit around. Like I need to get more books out, you know, like I feel like it's so easy to pressure yourself when you're writing. But my goal, I'm moving to Utah in a couple of weeks to go live with some mm. old roommates. And so my goal is to like stop working when they get home. So that way we all have the night to like Aww. exercise and make dinner together, or just hang out, you know? And I think that that'll be better for me because I, yeah, I'm really terrible. Like it's like on one hand, I somehow seem to suck at self-control because I just work all the time, but I'm like, but does that make me really good at self-control? 
I mean, kind of in a way it does because you're focusing on the job at hand. And I totally get that because I would like, if I didn't have my son to help like create like a checks and balance kind of (laughs) thing, that's all I would do. So yeah, it's hard. Like, cause you like love it. And also you want, like, I don't know about you. Are you wanting to like use this as your full-time job? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're like, you're like, I have to get stuff out and like get my, you know, you have to figure out how to make it work. And it just takes so much work to get it going and like trial and error and like also it could just be like a matter of time and like getting enough backlog like there's just so many things that you don't know when you're learning and there's like oh yeah also every time you learn something you're like well there's 10 more things I didn't know I didn't know yeah and a lot of it can help like I actually so I started something today like because I am trying to work like as an author writing full-time and doing all the interviews and stuff I set up a calendly and I'm like okay, let's see if this will help me like streamline stuff. Maybe I won't be having to check my email so much because I've been lost in emails for like the past month. So oh. I'm like, okay, if I miss something, I'm so sorry, guys. That's hard. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how people like when I, I talk to a lot of people like you who like do podcasts or blogs or whatever on top of their writing stuff. I'm like, how do you do that? That's so much time. But, like it also takes, it's shocking to me when people can like accomplish those it's a weird balance I will say that like I'm still working on that balance but it's because I I enjoy it like there's so many tips and tricks you can pick up just by talking to other authors that help your own like writing routines and it's Mm -hmm. it's awesome but on a different note where do you get your inspiration for your stories um well as cliche as it is most of mine have come from dreams so far like the magic series was like I had this dream of this boy who was trapped I guess not boy I mean he's like 16 but this teenage boy who was trapped in a crystal and it was like sucking his life like draining his life eventually and there was like I don't know it's like when you wake up you know it like immediately starts slipping away from you but I was like oh I gotta furiously take all the notes that I can and that's essentially what turned into the trilogy for magic for Andar um and then yeah I definitely had a nightmare that turned into the first Japanese haunting book (laughs) so nice that was terrifying and inspirational. <laughs> yes. Um, <clears throat> go ahead. No, you're, it, it's just crazy how dreams, because that's, I'm the same way. I get a lot of my inspiration. I've actually had a few people look at me like I'm crazy when I say I get <laughs> dreams that inspire my work. They're like, you dream that vividly. And I'm like, uh, yeah, like, am I not supposed to have vivid dreams? <laughs> like, is that not normal? So. Yeah, my the other day my niece was like, "Wait, you dream about people that aren't you?" And I was like, "I guess I do." <laughs> that's true. I mean, that's where some of the characters come from. So. Yeah. And speaking of characters again, did you have a favorite out of your characters that you enjoyed writing? Um, I like I said, I really like Gray because I just love his goofy, like always throwing jokes in their personality. But I also really enjoyed writing um the fourth Japanese book it was from Lincoln's point of view and Mm -hmm. he's half Japanese so I think I loved it so much because I could like throw in random like like when he'd be talking to his mom he'd be like oh it's got some of this and like like he'd throw in random Japanese phrases that were natural for him as a character but like you know the reader wouldn't explain wouldn't know so I'd like explain it in a natural way but like I loved being able to just pull on the Japanese bits for him because it all came so naturally as opposed to Selena who it was all new to her and she's like what am I supposed to do like should I bow my head here like how do I say thank you or like you know so that was really fun for me too just because I love Japan but also he's like he was he was fun but I think a lot of it was just <laughs> the Japanese influence yes that's awesome and I love that all the cultural stuff you put in there that because I told it would be like Selena what do I do here so <laughs> um yeah and then As an author yourself, for like new authors, new writers, just starting out their journey, what advice would you offer them? Um, I guess my go-to advice is to just don't be afraid to share your work with people. Like I know some people will work on the same story for years and they don't want anyone to read it until it's perfect. But I'm like, it's not going to ever be perfect until you get other eyes on it. You know, like no matter how good at editing you are or how good at revising your own work you are, there's only like your brain is going to be blind to the same plot holes it's going to miss the same like you can only have one point of view from your own brain you know Mm -hmm. so it's like the more people you can get to look at it 
not like you need to have 50 beta readers, but just like there, there, there's a limitation to working on your own. And so I think you shouldn't be afraid to get beta readers and to also be a beta reader. Cause I feel like I've learned so much from reading other people. So I'm like, you notice what they're doing well and what they're not doing well. And it makes you more aware of it in your own writing, like what you want to work on. And you're like, or you're like, Oh, okay. I do that the right way. So at least I've got that, that I know. <laughs> yeah. That's great advice. And then if you had something that you wanted to share with your readers that they did not know about you, what would it be? Um, let's see. Well, obviously everyone now knows that I love Japan. So that's not it. <laughs> I, oh, you know what? Here's something. I am the youngest of five kids and I am actually the only one in my family who is not married right now, but I have nine nieces and nephews. Ooh, that's a big family. I love it. Awesome. Yeah. Go ahead and tell our readers and viewers where they can find you and your work. Okay, so on um, Facebook, you can just go down. It's like Laura and Drake Books, I think. And then Instagram's the same. It's Laura and Drake Books. I'm trying to work on like Twitter, but I'm super inactive, but I'm going to work on that. And then I have a website, just do like Laura and Drake Books, Wixsite.com. And then, my, yeah, so that's like you can join the mailing list there. And I like to offer free bonus things at the end of like, each book to try and encourage people to sign up. So if you want free scenes from the characters, I'd go um, like look in the back of the books and then you can join the mailing list. But yeah, I say those are some of the main ways. I'm also on Goodreads. Oh, Goodreads is a good one. Like I have my newest book that I'm working on up there already that you can like follow Ooh. so it'll let you know when it's getting released. So yeah, I'm excited about that one. Awesome. And social media is so hard to like, it's hard to keep up with all of them. So they're demanding. Yeah. But the most active one, would you say, is your Facebook? Um, no, I'd say it's probably, well, I am trying to do better with my Facebook. Mm -hmm. Like, and I do post there, but I feel like I only post when I have things to announce. But I feel like I want to do better about announcing other people, like other authors' releases. Or like, hey, here's a good deal. Or like, you know, trying to get it more active. Yeah. But I, I'd actually say I'm pretty terrible at all of them right now. <laughs> They're hard like, to keep up. Yeah, it's like there's so many. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. But I, I think Facebook and my email are the ones that I'm going to focus on the most. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today, Laura. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Have a great day.